Okay. <laughs> well, anytime you're going to do any kind of uh, troubleshooting or stuff, and, and I could I, I could have picked a whole lot of different stories to tell about a lot of different jobs that we've done in here on this. Um, but at the same time, uh, whenever there's some basic rules of diagnosis here. Now, the reality of whatever you're investigating is hidden from you. If it wasn't, you wouldn't need to investigate it, right? Now, some of the stuff you're doing is just, you know, straightforward stuff. Like you're just popping a set of brake pads on, you're doing an oil change, uh, with the transmission swaps you're doing, you know. Uh, we did some troubleshooting, you know, on that uh, Explorer before we decided that something had died on the inside of it was causing it to skip third, you know, and all that. So, and there's been all kinds of situations I can think of, you know, where something pretty quick and easy would fix one, but there are times when it don't. Now, we've seen the same problem over and over enough to know what the problem is. Remember the fuel gauge on the Silverado? I, told, I, I texted him about that. He texted me, what about my fuel gauge? I said, well, you're probably going to have that sending unit. That is a picture of the sending unit that came out of that truck. You see what's wrong with it? It went a little, sets of finger broke off of it. And for those fuel cinders, uh, those, those Chevys are, are legendary for having fuel cinder failure. Yeah. Happens all the time. Anyway, but because I knew that I had seen so many of those, I knew what the probable cause was. And so he actually just bought the sitting in it, not the whole pump, and <coughs> managed to pop it in there. Y'all did a good job on that, by the way. It's a good call. But this, I've seen it before, isn't always the case and can misfire. I worked with a guy one time that had a really, really good memory about stuff he had seen before. But if he ran across something that he hadn't seen before, he didn't know how to figure out what was wrong with it. You know, he was his troubleshooting skills weren't that great. He's an intelligent guy. Well, to find the truth, the investigator, that's whoever's doing the work, has got to gather and analyze data in a way that our investigation leads us to the correct <coughs> conclusion. If we don't wind up at the correct conclusion, then we got issues. The diagnostic process requires we know enough about basic principles to know what data we need to gather. That's why, you know, a lot of this uh, basic principle stuff you're getting from Electude and stuff. Because the reason I like Electude is because there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to forget to tell you. There's some stuff that I've known so long I think everybody ought to just know it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like for example, you don't put the lug nuts on with the tapered side out. You know, I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't know that. But, you know, believe it or not, I've seen some people... I've actually seen people that did brake job after brake job after brake job after brake job and did it right, and then on a really important brake job, they put the pads on with the metal toward the rotor. And I couldn't believe it when I saw it happen. I don't know if they just weren't paying attention or whatever. You know what happens then? The first time you hit a brake, goes scrub. You know, your, your lining is facing the wrong way and the metal back and it's toward Why the rotor. Why do you do that? I mean... I don't know, but I have actually seen that happen here two times, and the people that did it both times were pretty doggone good at their work. But they just, I'd say, why did you do that? I don't know. They just didn't have a clue. Either that they weren't paying attention or what. But it'll go on there backwards just beautifully. You know, and just scrub up and destroy a rotor faster than you can ever leave. We need to know how to gather the data the right way. Now, we need to know how to interpret the data once we've gathered it. So we need to, say, we need to know what information to throw out, what information is going to factor in, and we don't need to get sidetracked. You got my son? Have you ever seen somebody, uh, they're talking about, um, well, like for example, somebody said, uh, my car starts hard, maybe I ought to put a fuel filter on it. How's that sound? That don't work. Fuel filter won't keep it from starting. You know, it's basically give you, make you lose power driving, but as far as making it start hard, I can't really see that. I don't know. So maybe I haven't seen everything, but typically I'm not looking for a fuel filter if i got a hard start problem. Jennifer's Oldie. Jennifer's Oldie. We gathered data by physically looking for the leak, right? We put some dye in there, and we had to take that stupid uh, heat shield off of it so we could see it. And But the car still goes low on engine oil with no appreciable leak, so it has to be going out the tailpipe. Right? And this is major stuff, so she just needs to make sure she keeps oil in it. The problem with that is if you fool around and wait until it goes really low before you put the oil in it, there could be some knocking <coughs> on and, and racket and all that. It stalled on me this morning, first time ever. Oh, I can't believe this. Not the first time ever. When you first came here, it was running like a three-legged dog. Remember yeah, that? but I mean, at the red light, it stalled out when I went to go. Uh huh. And it probably don't have any oil in it, so that made me think about the oil. I was like, wait, I need to keep oil in it. Yeah, you better keep that dipstick pulled out. You didn't even have a dipstick before, did you? Or, no? I did, but it broke off in there. Yeah. 
We replaced a whiny, unproductive power steering pump and found that while she had initially had good steering after we put the pump on there, the problem returned because the belt was stretched and wouldn't tighten, and it takes a lot of oomph to pull a power steering pump so the belt was slipping. So it needed replacing. That wasn't hard to figure out. You know, when your steering went away, we had to figure out what's going on. You can tell the belt's loose, you know, remember that? All right, so lack of power on a V6 Monte Carlo. After checking for fuel and air filter issues, check for exhaust back pressure, replace the catalyst, and do it right. Uh, the best way to check for exhaust back pressure uh, is to screw the oxygen sensor out, put a, put a uh, fitting in there. I built one and we use it. Uh, you know, when you buy a catalytic converter, a lot of times they'll have a little 18 millimeter, one and a half thread pitch plug in there where the oxygen sensor goes. <coughs> and uh, if you got to screw that out of there and put an oxygen sensor in there, take, keep that plug. Just keep it. Now drill the hole through it, tap the appropriate threads, put a, a uh, bleeder, brake bleeder in there. Well, and you've made you a fitting that you can use with one of these plain old fuel pressure gauges to check the uh, back pressure. Uh, we had a, uh, a dog on uh, Trailblazer one time, about like yours, but it was somebody else's. And uh, we, it was, he says it just didn't quite feel right. And we pulled the oxygen sensor out after we did a bunch of other checking. Pull the oxygen sensor out, screwed that thing in there. He had five pounds of, of, uh, pre of back pressure. Not supposed to have any. So we put another catalytic converter on there, and it was just like a new vehicle again. I've still got that cat around here somewhere. I think that's it. Let's sit right up there, that little rusty round one. Uh, there should be no back pressure for the catalytic converter. Now, Jesse right here is holding this gauge. We were checking, see this old clogged up cat? We were checking, and this is what kind of back pressure we had. This is where the gauge was resting, and it swings around. All, I mean, it went all the way around to there. And it's nearly 30, uh, you know, whew, it was bad. That's why you... All right. So, you some tests are only valid pinpoint issues if the test fails. This is just one example. Using the diode function on a DVOM to test an alternator is one of those tests. If the alternator fails the diode test, you set your meter on diode test, you go from the positive terminal of the case, look at your reading, switch the leads around, look at your reading again, it'll usually be 550 one way and nothing the other way. If it's not reading either way or it's reading both ways, then that's a, that's a go no go test, you're done. It can pass that test though and still the alternator can be bad, so keep that in mind. Just because it passed that test doesn't mean you got a good alternator. Because you can't, if that doesn't tell you if the brushes are wore out, doesn't tell you if the rotor's open, doesn't tell you any of that. It just tells you if you've got problems with the diodes, because there's more to an alternator than the diodes. All right? The fan test, using a test light in series with a fan motor is another go-no-go -no -go test. You know, when you pull the fan relay out and you find out the terminal that goes out to the fan, you hook your battery test light to hot, and you touch the, and by the way, on that white truck out there, after I preached and preached and preached and preached about don't ram the test light down in there and spread the relay terminals. Somebody did that on that one for the starter. I don't know why they did it, but you can look down in there and see where they rammed that test light down there and spread that thing out. You know how hard it is to try to fix that in a GM fuse panel? You know, it's a pain. Anyway, that's a screwed up mess. Anyway, if it fails the test where you turn it through and look for the light to wink off, you're done with that test as far as knowing whether you've got a good or a bad fan. Uh, so I've talked about that enough times, I don't need to beat on it. Testing a fuel pump this way works too. Now what you do, then you're gonna get you a piece of uh, insulated wire, a little, I'm talking about skinny insulated wire, you know, like you'd like to sell at the uh, uh, lumber, and wrap it around, 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 around like that, so you've got you a little multiplier. And then you take that little multiplier and you hook it up between the 30 pin and the one going out to the pump so that it's, it's running like that. And then you take your little inductive lead that's hooked to your scope and you put it on there. When you wrap it around and around and around like that, it multiplies the signal to the point where you can get a really good signal. And if you see this right here, you know everything is just fine. But you get an early uh, warning on fuel pump failure by looking at that with a scope. Uh, on that, you know, you know how whenever you bypass it, it'll make the fuel pump run? Like we, and we're using our meter to do it, see how many amps the pump is pulling, right? Mm -hmm. All right, you can actually hook up the same way with this little multiplier that's wrapped around and around and around and tied up together, and then go around, you know, these loops with your uh, lead. I can show you that out in the shop. But anyway, that's going to give you a really good, so we've got a good fuel pump and a bad. As a matter of fact, in a briefcase in here, I've got a good pump and a bad pump. 
and a, and a built-in multiplier where you can see the difference between a good pump and a bad pump right there in the little briefcase, you know. I put that together for that purpose. All right, so here's a simple example of how we're going to investigate something, right? We're going to do a little investigation. This is not terribly complicated. We turn the key. The key is supposed to start the car, but it doesn't. When you turn the key, what piece of information do we need to gather next? Turn the key is supposed to start the car, but it doesn't want to be Somebody tell me what we're looking for. What, what, what's happening? I'm turning the key and the car don't start. What's your next question? You're not in this is situation. Is the starter getting power? Is the, is the starter, how do we know the starter getting power? Transition? Huh? I mean... No, I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you expect to hear? Are you okay? You hear a click or something. What are you supposed to hear? Click or something. Uh, you ought to hear something, right? Yeah. All right, so all I'm hearing is the faintest little click. <laughs> All right. We got bad, bad All right. We've already got two pieces of information. Click the noise from the starter with no operation. We notice the instrument cluster lights are very weak. My oh, battery dead. That's an old hot shot there. So what are your thoughts? All right. What's, that's your first possibility. What's the second possibility? Bad connections to the bottom. Of the that's good. I mean, he's, listen to that. He's thinking. He's basically investigating. He's thinking, I'm, I'm looking, these are my two possibilities. See, you're already postulating in your mind. This could be a bad battery. It also so could be battery terminal connection. Right? All right, so dead battery, bad connection somewhere. Where are we going to start on that? Battery. You know how hard it was for me to wrap that stuff and film it so I could put it up there? <laughs> All right. All right, so hood open, visual inspection. Brush or wash away the corrosion, remove the terminals. Test the battery. Good long. Long. You like that? It looks good. That's that a picture. Good. I there's a picture I took right out here in the shop. That looks like there a is, nice clean battery. There, there is no <laughs> excuse for this. Uh, did you know whenever you've got the? I've not told this story before. I it's funny. I had a Thunderbird one time. They gave me when I was at Ford. <coughs> Battery's dead on it. And I opened the hood and look at the battery, and there was a pile of ants across the top of the battery, a quarter of an inch deep, going from one post to the other. And the, the bodies of those ants had carried enough juice to worry to drain that battery. You know something? I mean, I, I cleaned the ants off the top of the battery and tested it, cleaned everything up, and it was all right. And those ants, that electricity just drives them wacky. They'll get in your, they'll get in your knock on pump contacts too, and uh, stop them from doing or getting a relay, and they'll crunch them and they don't feel that anymore. Hey, what's the grease that you're supposed to put on those posts? Huh? The grease that I talked about putting on the posts. Well, there is some grease that's special that's for that that you can put on there. There's also this spray that we put on there. You can put it about any kind of grease on there, and as long as it makes a barrier. And what I'm saying is any kind of grease works. But they make some as a brush in a can that you put on there, or you can spray the protector on there that we got that made by CRC. There's a bunch of different ways you can do that. WD-40. A lot of people used to do that. I imagine Tim's probably done that 688 times. Tim, you ever put pennies on top of the battery so that they don't gobble up the the chalk and stays away from the terminals. There's copper mm -hmm. pennies. I'm not talking about these zinc. <coughs> I'm about a copper penny. If you just lay it over by the battery terminal, it'll get all nasty and the battery terminal will stay clean. You know, it's crazy. Also, where did that come from? The connection is making a spark. What are you making it up as you go? <laughs> what you got between the what you got between here on that? Yeah, that's the last one. Around this. You're wicked. That acid up around this, capillary attraction, a lot of the time, that's what it is. Sometimes it comes out of here and it steams over there and all that. But what I always like, that's one, one thing that felt washer works like it does. That felt washer has got some alkaline to it and you put it on there and it basically stops that stuff from getting up on there because it soaks up the, the acid coming out of there. And, um, anyway, that battery is, I felt pretty bad one day. I had this, this <coughs> muscled up boy, this battery like that. Whenever I was at Walmart, we were walking along around, and the battery was empty, you know. And I said, Here, can you hold that? And he grabbed me and went, Whap! Hit his stuff on the face. <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad about oh, it. God. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> battery checks out fine after charging. Terminals clean and reinstalled. Charging system tested the result to 12.3 volts while it's spinning over. What does this mean? What is the normal charge voltage? I got the engine running. The battery checked out fine. I got good cold cranking amps in there. I'm going. I'm hooking my just look just hooking my meter up, and I've got 12.3 volts. And it's just sitting here running. And let's say if I put my uh, amp clamp on it, I go, I'm not getting any amps flowing either. What do you think of next? 
batteries, you know, I've charged the battery up, I've tested it, it tests good, crank the car, the car is sitting here running, but I'm seeing 12.3 volts and the battery's steadily dropping. What does that mean? Oh, not working. Or you, yeah, we're using the power out of the battery to run the car. Now here's another thing. Don't take the alternator terminal off to see if the car keeps running. But a lot of times what that is they'll send a spike screaming and screaming through a bunch of electronics and you'll wind up with stuff that don't work. You don't need that. Okay, so don't go there. All you gotta do is see if that Do you guys know how to keep do you guys if somebody wants you to take their battery terminals off or clean something or whatever, you have to take the battery out. How are you gonna keep from losing your memory on all your radio and the little Honda that says code when you're done and all that kind of stuff? What do you how do you do to prevent that? The battery terminal on the wall. The pause of the battery literally you go to the something about the off I can't remember what you said, but What? I can't remember what you said. You take your jumper box and you hook it between the engine block and the big post on the alternator. It's over here, so the battery's over there. Take the battery out, you're still feeding all that stuff. Now they got these silly little things with this nine volt thing you plug in a cigarette lighter. That ain't worth a darn, because a lot of times your cigarette lighter ain't even tied into the same circuit instead of the thing. Is. But basically what you're doing is that only works if the cigarette lighter's hot all the time. Alright, so next up, battery charge light on, wires connected to the alternator, strong 12 volt power, and the big alternator terminal. So you gotta have 12 volts here. See if this wire, if it is broke, it's not gonna charge either. You gotta make sure that your charge light's working. Your ignition switch is sending that 12 volts through there so that it'll turn on that regulator. And then right here, this one right here is a sense wire that's going to tell the uh, little internal voltage regulator how much voltage is in the battery so it'll know what to do with the field. But anyway, we want to know first, I mean, I've actually, uh, I fell in a uh, trap one time. I popped an alternator on without checking this stuff and there was something wrong between here and here. So there was no power there. So before you throw an alternator at it, Make sure to start with the charge light's working, because I'm going to mention that on my next slide. Also make sure that you got a good strong 12 volts right here. That means this and that, and that are connected. If this can't make it to there, it's not going to charge either. So before you throw the alternator in it, let's gather our data on what's there. Uh, do we have 12 volts here? You're just about going to have to read that with the meter coming through the charge light, because if you put a test light there, it might burn real dim or it might not burn at all. And so basically I'm going to check that, see if i got 12 volts coming through there when I switch on the key. And basically on this one right here, I'm going to see if I've got good uh, hot current there, which is basically going to feed the brushes in the alternator. Alright, so to find that truth, the detective investigator must gather and analyze data in such a way their investigation leads into the truth in all its reality, so it's easy to miss things. Here's the data, no crank, verified. Weak voltage, verified. Battery clean and tested. Okay, check alternator connections. Okay, conclusion was replace the alternator and retest. Now, how many of you would have jumped over some of those and thrown an alternator at it without checking the other stuff? How many of you have ever known of anybody that threw an alternator at it and that didn't fix it and now they're back at square one? But now you've bought an alternator and or a lot of times if you buy some of these electronics from parts house, they don't want them back. You can't take them back. Yeah, yeah they don't want them back because you put it on there and they don't know if you might have ruined it, you know. All right, so let's go here. If the investigator doesn't gather enough data, whatever done is a guess. I know you had never guessed at anything, have you? Nah. Oh, come on, man. Uh, anybody ever guessed at something and why find it disappointed in yourself? I've had people call me and say, I've already spent $488 on this car guessing at what's wrong with it, and I want you to fix it real cheap. You know, they, they wasted all their money. If the investigator doesn't gather data in the right way, then any repair performed may be done right, but still may not fix the problem. You got that? Still may not fix the problem. Usually the battery will be replaced first, will be a scenario outline, but then the alternator will be replaced. So a lot of the times they'll say, well, let's throw a battery at it. They throw a battery at it, and if they don't even check the thing to make sure that it's charging to begin with, throwing a battery at it, what's that going to do? They're going to drive out of there and it's going to come back on the hook, right? So you need to be verifying every darn thing. If there was a problem with the wiring, the alternator and the battery might be replaced unnecessarily. Remember how I told you you can pull one particular fuse that feeds the airbag light and the battery light on one of these, some of these Fords and air all the rest of the warning lights to work. You won't even notice that you don't have a battery light and an airbag light. Who's going to pay attention to that? But the alternator will not put out. And you can take it, and if somebody hadn't seen this before, they may put three or four alternators on it trying to get it to charge. It will never charge. If the wire coming through that light is shorted to ground, it won't charge. If the wire coming through that light is cut, somehow the rats chewed it. That does happen. It won't charge. 
and you can throw a bunch of alternators at it without even having, you know, looked at it the right way. All right, so when an investigator or a researcher comes to a false conclusion by either not gathering enough data before attempting to repair, that person has what is known as statistical research as a type one error. Didn't gather enough data to find the truth. Got it? Truck, shotgun troubleshooting can be expensive. All right, so in this case, the truth remains undiscovered. You like that? When well, the truth remains undiscovered? You ever do that? You work on yours a lot, don't you? The truth remains undiscovered because you didn't gather enough information, or you didn't sort it out the right way, or you didn't put everything together the right way. More work is going to have to be done. All right, so anybody that claims they haven't made a top one error is not being truthful. The 2007 Buick Hard, hard Start No Start issue. We verified fuel pressure, it remained solid. We found when it wasn't starting, there was no fuel injection and no spark, but the crank sensor signal was consistent. So this signal was consistent, but this signal was going away. We found when we lost spark and injection, we also lost cam signal, so we replaced the CMP. Timothy did that. All right, so we attempted to verify the repair. Even after you were gone Thursday afternoon, I shut that thing off and started it back up about seven or eight times. Six, seven times, whatever. I'd run it and get it good and hot, switch it off, fire it right back up. Let it run, get it good and hot, switch it back up. Well, on this round of tests, started normally every time. There was no time that day for a long test drive, but TJ took the took it for a long drive, parked it, and the no start happened again. You know, so this was a top one error. We have, we figured, and I've seen this kind of thing before, you'd swear it was fixed, you know as far as you can tell, but you know you got to spend a lot of time making sure, whatever. So based on this scope capture, we know our cam sensor, our ignition, and our fuel injection are all gone at the same time. See, we've, this is spinning slower, that's why these are farther apart, right? And we took this recording right before this. this. It was running when we took that recording. We switched it off, we went and restarted it, and we had this, and you were involved with this, weren't you? This cam trace was gone, Ignition gone, fuel pulse gone. Now I have done. I have made a recording with a Wacon flight recorder that uh, also showed us the same information about how we didn't have fuel pulse and we didn't have ignition, but it didn't. We weren't checking the cam trace with that one because we didn't have the you know um, we didn't that like, that little Wacon recorder will only record four things at one time. All right, so. Here's the cam sensor. This is the Hall Effect sensor right here. You'll look at a big picture here. This is the ignition module, the thing that you that was underneath the coils, right? That's this piece right here. And you notice that these are wired directly to that, right? These are wired directly to that. Now, the other question is, where were we taking our samples at? We were taking our sample right here on that wire, right there, the brown white wire and on the uh, crank CKP signal uh, one, because it's got two crank sensor signals. One of them has got 18 pulses and the other one's got three. I mean, they're all, it's all part of the same sensor. Uh, but the same 12 volts that feeds this one here, you notice it goes and feeds that one. And the same ground goes to that one too. Now, the, the no start that we got now, I hadn't even seen the car again. I don't know if it's back over here or not, because uh, I, I didn't see it out there, and Tim didn't call me after he called me that afternoon. But uh, uh, what I'd be wanting to know is, do we have 12 volts right here when this goes away? You know, you see, uh, this is how you got to start thinking. That's the little spoke fuel pattern there. That's the scope pattern there. This is the injector, and I got that down there coming off the PCM. But you see all this information that goes out to the PCM from this? This is the clearinghouse for all of that stuff. Low resolution speed signal, medium resolution speed signal, camshaft position signal is fed out to the engine controller. We weren't measuring it down here. We were measuring it where it comes from the sensor into the ignition control module. See, part of what we're doing here is looking at this map so we can get an idea. All right, now, okay. Finally, a top two error is to reject the truth and believe something false. You ever seen anybody do that? Truth right in front of your eyes, you know. That's something we might try to do when a vehicle we worked on comes back because we did something wrong or didn't do everything right. 
Now, if we miss something and it happens to everybody, it's always best to avoid top two errors, give the customer the benefit of the doubt from the outset. Whenever they come in and say, you know, you did something to my car and now it's doing this, they say, well, let's look and see what we got. Instead of getting uh, bowing up at them and say, oh, you know, getting mad to start with, then you got to eat crow when you find out yeah, it was something we did. You know, I mean, that's an easy trap to fall into. <coughs> All right. Uh, Camry with an all week shop charge uh, $400 to replace the hand gasket. That's why I like his little motor over the stand. Camry 36. Huh? All right. He's a long way from home, so we check and find out the oil pump gasket is the problem. The oil pump gasket is here. That's the oil pump. And there's a gasket right there in that O ring that likes to leak on these Camrys. This was a type 1 error. Since the oil was running down and dripping off the pan, the wrong conclusion was reached. I actually sent this picture back to the shop that did the work and they gave the guys $400 back. You know, which is totally unusual, but they realized that it was, uh, you know, because he had to add a half, uh, like a quart of oil over 150 miles on his trip over here. All right, so there's paid researchers in today's academic and scientific community that aren't really looking for the truth. They're only interested in discovering what they're paid by others to prove. There are people out there that are studying things and they say, we want you to study this, this is what you want you to find. And we'll pay you this if you find this. If you don't find this, we won't. I guess that's the way it's going on because it's, they're looking to fabricate a predetermined conclusion when they discover some genuine scientific fact that refutes what they're trying to prove. They suppress or ignore the data. That's a type two error. Here's one. Facts about CO2. 100 mile, thousand molecules of atmosphere. 35 of those are CO2. One molecule of those is man-made. And we're supposed to think that we need to do away with anything that makes CO2 and we'll save the planet, right? In spite of the fact the U.S. didn't sign the Paris Accords, the U.S. has cut carbon emissions by over 40 million tons in 2017 alone. Signing the Paris Accords doesn't make you more energy efficient. Other countries that signed the Accords are doing worse than we are. So signing the Accords just means you're willing to give some of your money to third world countries so their dictators can sit there and buy Mercedes and let everybody start with that. All right, so uh, only 0.001% of water vapor is man-made. Water vapor is the most is, is responsible for almost all global warming. This is how much water vapor is. Only 0.117% of CO2 is man-made. That's how much CO2 affects global warming. This is how much water vapor affects it. Matter of fact, if you look up, the EPA has already said that water vapor is a greenhouse gas. What are we going to do? Get rid of the clouds? All right, avoid top two errors. In the business of troubleshooting and repair, top one errors are bound to happen even what seems like simple repair. We can be careful in gathering our data and avoid this kind of error most of the time. When we do experience a top one error, we should be prepared to admit it and do what we can to deal fairly with the situation. Sometimes it may be costly, but a good name is difficult to earn and easy to lose. You ever had a good name and lost it for some reason? What's wrong with this picture? How did that happen? Four, that ain't the only one on this truck. There was a bunch of them that went through. Where? Huh? Yeah, where and where? Wasn't just where. I think the darn thing was Pull. maybe yeah. it floated yeah. some valves or something. <laughs> you think? You know what it means when it floats a valve? The engine running so fast and so hard that the uh, pistons hit the valves before they've had time to close. I don't know if that's what happened here or not, but there was a truck that came in at Donnie's shop over had several of these. And, you know, a little bit of wear. It seemed like it had you know, all wear other places, too, didn't it? All right, plain old errors and dirty deals. There's plain old errors. Sloppy work is included in this category. That's a, that's a Charles repair right there. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, sometimes uh, we leave out screws because we either forgot where they went or we lost one. It was hard to come by. You got that? Yeah. All right. And sometimes even changing spark plugs can be devilishly tough. See the spark plug number there? That's real, that's real spark plug. That's not retouched. We got we had them out here in 666. I think I'd have given that thing a 667 number or something. Anyway, don't whine. Don't cross thread them either. Use pressure, use pressure and move to determine whether the plugs are seating properly when you're not sure. I did this on a van. I had the spark plug down in a hole, and you couldn't tell if it was all the way down. And I had to fix the threads with a 14 millimeter thread tap. And I, yeah, and I put the Prussian blue on it, and whenever I saw that it had smeared it, I knew it had seated all the way down. See, so you, you need to have some indication of it anyway. Uh, ever done this? That's another Charles repair. Yep. Yeah. 
See how you got voltage drop right here and heat resistance and all that kind of thing and heat resistance right here. They're just trying to hook a bunch of stuff on there. And further got that bolt, that, that, that thing screwed to the side of the side pole's battery. I mean, it'll get you out of it. If you're on an interstate and you're having to get back to the house, do 